All right, good morning all. Welcome to 2023, our first uh, Coffee and Compliance webinar of the year. Um, we're trying a little bit of a new format this year. We're gonna be talking about enforcement cases and also new regulations and trends out there uh, in our Coffee Compliance series. From time to time, we'll bring in guest speakers, whether that be attorneys, regulators, uh, or folks from the industry to share their viewpoints on a lot of these topics. But we're gonna try to look at what are the enforcement cases? What's to be learned from that? And any kind of trends that we might see? And then also look at uh, regulations from the past 30 days or so. So for today's Coffee and Compliance, we're gonna be talking about all the stuff that got dumped out there in December and in late 2022. Um, there's a lot of action right at the end of the year, probably got buried with the holidays and all. Um, so we wanna revisit that and share what to think about, what to look forward to from a regulatory enforcement standpoint, and also just what do you have to do for reporting and all for the year ahead? Before we dive into that, a uh, quick intro. I'm Ryan Janik. I'm one of the co-founders here at Mapistry, and I'll get into Mapistry in a little bit. And usually for these audiences, we've got folks that are customers that use the Mapistry software platform. We've got folks in the industry, attorneys, other regulators, and then just facilities, EHS leaders, um, EHS managers. Uh, there's quite a diverse group out here. A couple uh, housekeeping things. Feel free to submit any questions you have in the chat panel. I'll try to get to it. We've got a half hour blocked out for today. Um, I'll try to get to any questions. Can also follow up if there's like relevant, like some of the stuff we've covered in more depth um, that's related to this uh, that I can follow up with you have future questions. Uh, and then it's also helpful for me to understand, like, are there other speakers that you'd want us to dive into these topics in even more depth on a future coffee and compliance? So one of the things I wanted to share is at Mapistry, we're an environmental compliance platform. So we take everything there is to do around environmental, whether that be remembering to file reports, tasks, corrective actions to digitizing inspections, checklists, audits, all of that, to all your maps, your plans, your permits. And the reason we do it is because this is something that we see in the industry for environmental leaders and EHS leaders in general is data is very siloed. You've got it all kind of disconnected. You don't have really great visibility to actually be proactive. You're constantly in firefighting mode. Um, there's also just not a lot of time for you or your teams to actually enter that data and review it. And as you'll see, there's a lot more on air, water, waste requirements. Um, and something we'll talk about today is specifically around air and water uh, and how that relates to EPA national com compliance initiatives. And the fact that there's a lot more third party scrutiny, which will also come up today uh, quite a bit, as you'll see. And I, our, my belief, our, our belief is you can't rely on the current mix of Outlook reminders, Excel paper uh, today to actually run a comprehensive environmental program. So what we did is we, we've we built a software platform that takes all these different parts of your envir environmental program and we focus very deeply on environmental. We do a little bit of safety stuff, um, but most of our stuff in our software platform is environmental. Get it all in one place so you can look at the analytics side, like this visualization you're seeing here, to actually make decisions and understand the data, understand risk factors, like is this region or this facility really at a high risk for some of these enforcement uh, settlements and all that we're gonna talk about today. So if you're interested in learning more about the Mapistry environmental compliance platform, how we think about environmental data, uh, feel free to reach out to me um, because one of the things we really wanna make this, make it easy for you all to get started with software for your environmental programs and really centralize it. So we've got an amazing customer experience team that onboards you in the software process uh, and then stays with you and from a support standpoint, but just also making sure you're getting value out of the environmental compliance platform, answering questions, building those really cool data visualizations so you can extract, like if you do an SPCC inspection, uh, you want to understand, well, not just that I did the inspection, but how do I know what the most problematic tank I might have in all my facilities, hundreds of them, thousands of tanks? What's the top five tanks I should be worried about? Well, we can extract that data out. And that's thanks to our solutions engineering team to be able to extract that data, give you visualizations around it. So not only a software platform, but a whole you know, group of people supporting that and making sure environmental leaders are successful. So let's dive into the details. So 2022 enforcement report from EPA came out. Um, 
couple interesting things to note here. 56% of on-site inspections were around facilities found to be uh, linked to for based on environmental justice data. And this will keep coming up. You'll notice as a theme. Um, and 44% of enforcement cases had some sort of nexus with environmental justice. Um, this builds on the executive order signed in May 2021. Um, by Biden, also on the internal um, EPA Administrator Reagan memo um, from April 2021, also really making these priorities around environmental justice under the more info. And Julianne on our team will send out these slides afterwards and recording of this. Um, so if you want to look up more, but if you're in a facility uh, near in, in that data set around environmental justice, um, that greatly increases your likelihood of getting inspected in an enforcement case. We also saw over 5,000 on-site inspections, um, which was a big jump up from 2021. We're seeing the COVID kind of rebound on the on-site inspections. So seeing that quite a bit. Um, the other thing to, to pay attention to is this combination of environmental justice data that's publicly available, but also what is being built out with ECHO. So those are, you know, ECHO has been around for a while for enforcement um, database around facilities, but they added something interesting this year, which is ECHO Notify, where you can plug in the facility information and you can get an alert uh, of any kind of violations near your facility. So not only is ECHO being increased from like a data standpoint, and this is why, uh, on the kind of private side, why we're so passionate about giving our customers in the industry tools to get out ahead of this. Um, because right now, unfortunately, for a lot of companies, Echo, the EPA, and third party groups have more data on their facility than, say, a VP of EHS does um, because the lag on the development of software and data sets internally for companies. Um, with the expansion of ECHO by EPA, um, we saw it with the Inflation Reduction Act, more and more funding to these data sets, to ECHO in particular. Uh, it becomes a really powerful database for violations, and there's a bunch of work going into that around how do I automatically alert around violations for enforcement actions. And then two, uh, the public access side. So this ECHO Notify is uh, one example of it, where you can get third party groups and public paying attention to your facilities more and more. Uh, and it's automated, um, which I think is is very different than having to like file a Freedom of Information Act, a FOIA request, and actually dig through a bunch of stuff. Um, so we're seeing more public insights, more ability for both agencies and third party groups to pull these data. And I think we'll see more targeted enforcement because of that. The other trend is they did meet their goal. One of the national um, compliance initiatives for EPA was to reduce significant non-compliance with the Clean Water Act. Um, they were at 20% non-compliance, they're at 9%. And talking to some of the folks involved with that project, um, that like nine persistent percent is, is a lot of repeat. Um, they've had real trouble doing, they've tried a bunch of different like out, outreach and engagement methods to get people to file reports. And that 9% is a very sticky, very persistent group where they're not they're really struggling to get over that. So I, it'll be interesting to see as it'll come up in the uh, national compliance initiatives, how they try to re reduce that even more. The other thing I wanted to, to note was criminal charges. Um, it was the lowest in criminal cases, um, but two that they called out was uh, Omaha Rail Car Cleaning Company around waste determination and not, um, uh, not protecting workers. Um, a couple of workers died as part of that cleaning. So you'll see a lot a lot of the like waste determination but this is the the extreme of it where they were cleaning and uh, it resulted in, i believe in an explosion but i mean environmental and safety violations and then the other one that's that's interesting is um oak stockton a biofuel company um director of operations so years ago we used to talk about like the risk of a plant manager you know signing on the dotted line for discharge monitoring reports this was a criminal case where they were willingly dumping industrial wastewater um, overriding different sensors for like uh, the wastewater discharges um, this is something that as an ehs leader environmental leader you really want to make sure you're gathering that data and you have the data that this sampling is being done, it's being done correctly. You have records of it, it's not just at a facility. Uh, but this was 18 months in prison for illegally dumping, dumping industrial wastewater. 
So there's a couple links down there uh, looking at the 2022 enforcement report. Um, I think it caught some people by surprise just reading other other folks' views on this of that there wasn't more um, on-site inspections, maybe more enforcement cases. It'll be interesting now in 2023 if anything changes from an enforcement standpoint, if there's more of a push to do enforcement. Um, but it was, I think, overall lower than what people were expecting. So one of the things looked at from December um, was settlement agreements. And this is an interesting one, and it brings up the topic again around environmental justice. This was a neo green manufacturer. Uh, it was a settlement for not managing waste properly and character, characterizing it. But in the consent decree, and I, haven't, I have not seen this, um, now granted I have not looked through uh, a, a hundreds of consent decrees and settlement agreements, but this called out specifically that the company must use the environmental justice screening and mapping tool when choosing a disposal facility. So it's not just characterize it, manage your waste correctly, um, but you also have to find the facility for disposal that is fits into this, um, you know, this data set that, that that the EPA has. And it's an interesting use case of the environmental justice uh, data set that they have. And I'm curious where they go with this. It's not so much that this particular one uh, it raises huge concerns. It's what else will be put into settlement agreements, consent decrees related to EJ screen or the data tools they have? You know, how how much will they ratchet it down? And this may seem nuanced. And potentially, when signing the settlement agreement, it was it was not uh, as much you know thought about. But depending on where you choose your waste disposal, the trucking costs are often one of the biggest factors in that waste disposal. So if you start limiting like local disposal locations because of this. Um, that could really uh, significantly increase your, your costs. So it'll be interesting where this goes um, in the inclusion of the environmental justice database in a settlement agreement. The other settlement agreement, this is another one. Um, if anybody's really interested in some of the waste um, management disposal related to transportation, we did a, a great webinar and podcast on this. Um, with one of the attorneys in the field around this. This has been kind of a lingering thing. This was a settlement agreement um, that came with T-Forge, which has 174 facilities, 39 states, trucking, distribution, but it really is a spin out uh, from a UPS settlement um, that I saw at upwards of $5.3 million penalty for UPS around managing waste. And this, and some of this, I. Did not dive into the specifics on this, whether it was retail returns, you know, stuff gets sent back. But with the rise of e-commerce, we're going to see a lot more of this in the trucking and distribution business uh, of, you know, how do you manage waste? If you get something returned, uh, something breaks, a pallet breaks, how do you manage that waste? How do you manage trucking facilities? So we're seeing targeted enforcement around the trucking and distribution businesses. The other thing is this started with a state level, um, Arkansas Department of Environmental Quality Inspection really blew up into this national thing for the company. Um, another kind of learning here is if you're getting like local level enforcement, use that as the prompt to look at your other facilities. Don't look at it as an isolated issue. Um, you know, make sure that you're protected nationally if you operate in multiple states. But this was a, or is an $860,000 penalty, 36 months to fix. Um, that's a pretty expensive, uh, you know, that's a pretty expensive penalty. Um, and something that we see EPA and other enforcement agencies, especially around waste management in the trucking transportation space, they come back and re-inspect. Um, you know, there's been a lot in even retail lo lo locations around waste disposal. And they'll do all sorts of sting operations. They'll do dumpster diving. They'll pull the trash again. Uh, it gets a lot worse the second, the third time around. So, a couple takeaways here. One is paying attention to waste uh, for the trucking business and, like, especially how you're managing it, how you're classifying it, um, your generator status. They really, really um, dove deep on the generator status here. So, trucking business, pay attention to that. Um, also, look for anybody if you're getting, if you operate in multiple states, regionally or nationally, that local level inspection, will that spiral out into other things? Um, you know, will they use that to go look at your other facilities and really make sure that the follow up, these 36 months to fix this problem, 
the takeaway here is like make sure you do everything to do that get that fixed um, especially with these waste violations of lots of facilities they come back really really hard on the second and third time we've seen that where you're in the multi-million dollar penalty side so switching topics a little bit outside of the enforcement actions want to jump into pfos pfoa uh, i know everybody's everybody's conference there's everybody's talking about this um, but this just keeps coming up and we're going to see this theme repeatedly on some of the enforcement and some of the regulatory trends. So EPA added nine more to TRI reporting. They did it through the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, the National Defense Authorization Act provides a framework for adding PFAS to TRI and all. Um, we're now up to 189 um, PFAS chemicals that are subject to TRI reporting. Um, and then the, the really interesting kind of like footnote in all of this is also in December, EPA proposed eliminating the de minimis or the really small tiny quantity exemption for TRI reporting related to PFAS. So uh, the takeaway here is there's more to monitor for, there's more uh, regulatory frameworks around that, and they are looking for everybody and anybody that has touched PFAS to start sampling for it and reporting. And you'll see more on that in a little bit. But just something to pay attention to, even if you don't think you you have it, um, the fact that they're taking away exemptions really means you, you've got to pay attention to what you're manufacturing, what you're reporting, what you're sampling for. The follow-up to this is they release tools. As you notice a trend, there's regulatory structure and then a lot of public data, a lot of you know, releases to everybody uh, for more information to learn more. Um, so there's a PFAS tools, it's a public website that aggregates all this data. So you've got on one hand, uh, a regulatory structure that's pushing in more and more data. Um, EPA, other agencies, or third party groups are asking for it, collect more data. The scary thing is, what do you do with that data? Is it tied to certain limits or benchmarks or is it just being pumped into a database? A lot of it's just being pumped into a database and then being exposed, and that can be good and bad. There's a lot of uh, ability for the public and companies to really understand what's out there, but there's a lot of room for misinterpretation or erroneous reporting. And I think that's the, the really kind of scary thing for companies is you've got to collect all this data and then submit it publicly, and it's being uh, wide open access. So something to pay attention to is if you're collecting data, really understanding what you're collecting before you're putting it out there. Um, but this this is the link to the new PFAS tools that really anybody can access. And we're seeing that with Safe Drinking Water Act, Clean Water Act discharges. I mean, everybody's sampling for this now and it's all getting pumped into these uh, public tools. So building on that, um, EPA just came out, I think six days ago, with their national compliance initiatives. Um, we did a webinar not, uh, in 2022 about national compliance initiatives. They set them every few years. Um, they're keeping four of the same ones, um, you know, having cleaner air by reducing excess emissions of harmful pollutants, um, reducing accidental releases, the si significant non-compliance in the NPDES program, program. So you saw that early on in the enforcement. Um, this continues to be a national compliance initiative. Uh, and something to pay attention to how they're going to handle that. I'm not sure exactly the route they're going to go on this, but I could see them saying that we already reduced uh, significant non-compliance by 50%, maybe going in a different direction of what is non-compliance um, in the NPDES program. So something to pay attention to if you're subject to any kind of like wastewater programs, stormwater programs, what does this mean for you? It's a lot more scrutiny, um, making sure your data is correct, that you're submitting what's out there publicly. They're also gonna keep drinking water standards. These were the four kind of rollover uh, national um, compliance initiatives. The two new ones um, that I really wanna pay attention to is one, I, you know, they very lofty goals, mitigate, mitigating climate change. Um, some of these others have been a little bit more specific. But I wanted to point out that one of the things they really want to focus on under the mitigating climate change is looking at um, excess emissions uh, in very specific industrial sectors. So if you have uh, solid waste landfills, oil and natural gas facilities, I would expect a lot more targeted enforcement around that. And then kind of to the extremes, looking at mobile, mobile sources, um, 
non-compliance around that uh, on the mobile source side. So if you have mobile sources, what is what does that mean? Um, we'll we'll see if this gets finalized. Comments are due March 13th, but just something to pay attention to what they're going to do on the, this kind of broad goal of mitigating climate change. And then, uh, as I kind of alluded to already, is like PFAS contamination, and it basically is we're going to enforce against it in every shape variety uh, out there. So this will continue to be a theme. We'll see more requirements like the TRI reporting uh, for submitting PFAS data. Um, more public access and bigger data sets around it, like the PFAS analytical tools. But now there's going to be a focused activity on compliance, compliance and enforcement around PFAS contamination, both for water discharges, for what you're reporting in manufacturing processes, for spills, um, and even historical uses in, in like ground, groundwater and soil cleanup. So these are the national compliance initiatives. We'll probably do a webinar just focused on this. Um, because these are worth digging into once they finalize them. Uh, typically, they finalize them in June of each year, so with comments due in about two months, uh, we should see these finalized and get a little bit more clarity on how they're planning to run compliance and enforcement around these initiatives. Switching topics from the compliance and, and enforcement side, um, WOTUS, Waters of the U.S., um, EPA and U.S. Army Corps finalized it. Again, uh, they went back to the pre-2015 definition. Um, as you all know, Trump administration came out with a different definition of WOTUS. That got overturned in the courts. A lot of fights around that. The problem is Biden administration went back to 2015 definition. However, there's a pending Supreme Court case, the Sackett case, um, that is sitting out there. So this creates a lot of uncertainty because a lot of people think the Sackett case is gonna reverse a bunch of this stuff. Even the Biden administration, my reading of it is, they, they even said, uh, we're gonna finalize a second definition in 2024 after the Supreme Court case comes out. This all makes it very, very confusing for folks because you've got, in a very short period of time, a lot of jumping back and forth over what is the definition of WOTUS, what I, I hear from a lot of uh, companies is that's tough to plan for. You know, when you're thinking about waters of the U.S. facility building um, changes, uh, looking at your waterways, it, it's not something you can change back and forth year after year. So I think there's a big um, interest in the business community to have certainty around this. I think I also sense a lot of fatigue on this issue of just back and forth, back and forth, and wanting to get a definition in place and stick with it, good or bad, however they interpret it. Um, but this has been back and forth for a while now, and I think people are ready for some sort of resolution to it. We're going to see it kind of play out in the courts, but we're also going to see it play out in the EPA and Army Corps, you know, finalizing a second version of this rule. So. They released this in December, right before the holidays. Some people might have missed it because it was end of the year. Um, but anyways, we're waiting on the Sackett case now. We'll see what happens with uh, WOTUS and what this means in practice for a lot of different businesses. So with that, um, do, if anybody's got questions, this was kind of a, a rapid fire round of enforcement cases, things to pay attention to, um, regulatory updates, what we've got coming out for this year. Um, feel free to submit some of your questions through the, the chat panel here. Let me pull up, we've got a couple. Um, one of the questions is, how are potential PFAS currently determined? You know, like SIP codes are used for your NPDES, your stormwater permits. Um, you know, the question is, will SIP codes be used to determine the potential um, presence of PFAS? And my answer is, that I'm not sure how they're determining it. Some of it is, in a lot of permits, there's general language of like, you should do your own review of industrial activities, chemicals, manufacturing, and determine what you need to sample for. Um, it would not surprise me that they add in certain, just everybody's got a sample for it. We saw that in California with TMDLs, where for some of them, they said, every facility, you just have to sample for it. Now, we had um, Travis Porter of Department of Ecology in Washington on, and similar question. Um, 
he he said they probably wouldn't add that into their industrial stormwater permit, but they might do it with other emerging contaminants. Um, so unsure on how that'll be determined if you'll have the sample for it. The hard part is you end up getting into this like fuzzy language where you're supposed to figure this out. Um, and there's risks in determining and saying, oh, well, we'll sample and see what we find uh, or not sampling. Like if you don't sample and then you're later found to have them in your processes, that could be bad, but you could preemptively sample and find things because they're so ubiquitous. So a lot of uncertainty. I don't know um, if they'll start mandating in certain sampling requirements, how they'll do it, if it'll be tied specifically to sick code. I could see them doing it a little bit, but I also could see more blanket like data grabs, which has been a trend we've been seeing. Um, one of the other questions is, any guidance, opinion on PFAS firefighting foam disposal? Now, I'm, unfortunately, I'm not a disposal person. Um, I think there's a lot of, I mean, the firefighting foam, both on the remediation side, there's there's a lot in the, from soil and especially federal facilities. That was one of the things that came up in the national compliance initiatives, I believe, is like really looking at that and regulating it around firefighting facilities. I don't have any guidance or opinion on PFAS firefighting foam disposal and how to handle that. Well, if there's no other questions, um, you know, feel free to reach out if you're interested in learning more about Mapistry's environmental compliance platform, um, what we can do from an analytics standpoint, and how we can centralize, standardize, and make environmental programs easier. Also, welcome the feedback on this format. Um, if people are interested in different topics, would like us to go in a different direction with our coffee and compliance series in 2023, let us know um, if there's any like really burning questions you have, topics you want to talk about, where you're looking for like guest speakers, feel free to reach out. My email is ryan, R-Y-A-N, at mapistry.com. Um, and thank you all for jumping in this morning and doing a rapid fire uh, update on enforcement trends, regulatory actions from the past 30 days.